Nate, I'm going to have you go ahead and come up here. I'll, most of you know Nate Hanan as Siri. My phone says it. <laughs> Nate Hanan, actually. So thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Got something in my throat <clears throat> a couple minutes ago, so bear with me. Hallelujah. <clears throat> well, I'm honored to uh, be able to give Pastor Margaret a, a rest this week. Um, I think it's awesome for, for pastors to get away and, and rejuvenate and refresh and uh, bring a fresh word back. So I'm honored to be able to help that process. <clears throat> um, hallelujah. I did inquire of the Lord um, this last week and a half uh, what what word he would have me bring tonight. And then as I was praying, um, he, did, he did give me one word. He started with one word. I wasn't very excited about this word at first. Uh, Clay knows what it is. We were talking about it earlier tonight. But the more that I thought about it and the more that I studied it, the more that I realized <clears throat> how amazing this word is. See, it's a very powerful word. So powerful it could change our lives. Our, our nation, it could change our world overnight. Overnight. Any guesses what this word is? Any takers? Nobody. Nobody? Anybody? Obedience? You nailed it. Spot on. Spot on. <laughs> All right. Obedience. Obedience. <clears throat> the, uh, the Hebrew word for obedience is, hopefully I don't butcher this, shama, S-A-M-A. It's actually used um, 1,159 times in the King James Version. Translated in ways like hear, hearken, obey, um, obedient, understand. <clears throat> And the Bible is full, I mean, just full of stories of, of people who were obedient to the word of the Lord. In fact, I would challenge you to try to find a story of a Bible hero that doesn't involve obedience in one way or another. And not just one time, but recurring obedience. <clears throat> obedience at its core is really just faith. It's trusting God. Trusting that he's going to do what he says he's going to do. Trusting that he is who he says he is. Trusting that he sees the big picture when we don't. Trusting that when he asks us to do something and we don't understand why, he understands and that's enough. Right? All of that causes obedience. It's really just trusting our Heavenly Father. <clears throat> and we must, we must change, we must shift our minds. Our mindset from... You know, this is something we have to be diligent or, or have to be obedient about to this is something we get to be obedient about. If we can make that shift, it changes everything. Obedience is how we show God that he can trust us. Now, perhaps obedience is just heavy on my mind because I have a three and a five-year-old at home. <laughs> um, Obedience is a big topic in our house at this stage. And obviously, we're trying our best to teach our children obedience. <clears throat> and not just obedience to us, but obedience to God. Amen? But we know that obedience will bless their life. We know that it will give them opportunities that other people won't get. Opportunities for obedience are opportunities for growth. Obedience will cause them to have an intimate relationship with Jesus. I mean, this is a powerful word, y'all. It can change the world. But it starts here, right? <clears throat> Matthew 28, 20. We'll start there in the NLT. And it's just pretty simple. It's Jesus. I mean, right before he ascends to heaven, he says, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. <clears throat> Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. 
So that's what we endeavor to do with our children. That's what we should endeavor in our own lives. <clears throat> you know, Faith and I were talking about this just, I guess it was last night or the night before, but <clears throat> we've gotten to see Aaliyah's five now, almost six, she'll be six in May. And we've gotten to see this, this shift in her recently where it's, she's actually looking for ways to please us. She's looking for ways to please God. So it's, it's, she's, she's coming out of these things that she has to do and into these things that she gets to do. And as a father that just, oh, man, you've, you parents, you, got, you understand. It's like that just makes your heart so happy when you see that in them. And I know that our Father God is the same way. <clears throat> but it's, it's a conscious decision. Our, our choice to obey or disobey is a choice. And it's our choice to make. Now, before I get too far <clears throat> into the topic of obedience, I feel like we need to have a big disclaimer. I feel like when you study obedience or you teach on obedience, it's really easy to get legalistic about it, uh, to get religious about it. <clears throat> so from, from the start, Let's just, let's just clarify, obedience does not qualify you for salvation. Okay? You were qualified for salvation the day you were conceived in your mother's womb. Now that's not the day that you received salvation, but that's the day you were qualified for it. You're a human with a beating heart. You're qualified. Let's pull up Ephesians chapter 2. 8 and 9, just for a refresher. I know Larry's going to beat me every time, but I just like reading it out of my Bible. <clears throat> Verse 8, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things you have done. So none of us can boast about it. Salvation is not a reward for obedience. It is a gift. And praise God for that. <laughs> that we don't have to earn it. That we don't have to be good enough to have it. <clears throat> that being said. Okay. We're going to get a little deep here. That being said. After you receive that gift you don't just get to live your life any way that you want. Salvation is about a relationship with Jesus, not just about a prayer that you said one day, way back who knows when. It's about a relationship with him. <clears throat> Let's pull over to John 15. We'll read a few verses here. We'll start in verse 1. <clears throat> Actually, I think I want it. Yeah, he's got the Amplified. Let's read that. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Any branch in me that does not bear fruit, or that stops bearing, he cuts away, trims off, takes away, and cleanses and repeatedly prunes every branch that continues to bear fruit, to make it bear more and richer and more excellent fruit. Hallelujah. You are cleansed and pruned already because of the word which I have given you, the teachings I have discussed with you. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. He says, dwell in me and I will dwell in you. Live in me and I will live in you. Just as no branch can bear fruit of itself without abiding in or being vitally united to the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever lives in me and I in him bears much abundant fruit. However, apart from me, cut off from vital union with me, you can do nothing. If a person does not dwell in me, he is thrown out like a broken off branch and withers. Such branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire and they are burned. <clears throat> A lifestyle of rejecting Jesus through our disobedience can cause us to be cut off from Christ. 
Now we know according to Romans 8 that God, that, that, that God will never stop loving us. Nothing can separate us from God's love. <clears throat> but he cannot choose salvation for us. And remember, we're talking a lifestyle of disobedience, not an instance. I mean, God is patient. You just think back to the children of Israel wandering around in the wilderness. I mean, they, they constantly disobeyed and, disobeyed and disobeyed and disobeyed and disobeyed and disobeyed until God's hands were tied because of the words that came out of their mouth. And finally, they got what they had been saying all along, and they all died. Except for the, short, the small remnant that got to move into the promised land. <clears throat> but God was patient and gave them every opportunity, and he does the same for us. So that instance of disobedience, nobody's perfect. I, 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 that, I'm right there. But it's that lifestyle of disobedience that can cut us off from Christ. <clears throat> you know, Faith and I have been married for a little over 12 years now. Um... And I, I, I liken this to, you know, if, if I had just had one conversation with her at the beginning of our marriage 12 years ago, and I had, I had, had not had another word with her since, and had refused to speak to her, do you think we would still be married today? I mean, that's a lot to ask of a spouse. She's patient. Praise God she is patient with me. But that's, that's, that's beyond patient. That's not a relationship. That's not how God designed husband and wife to connect. And that's not how God intends our relationship with him to be either. It's supposed to be communion. It's supposed to be constant. We need to tend to our relationship with God. Pay attention to it. Prioritize it. Focus on it. Um, nurture it. Let's look over at Philippians chapter 2. <clears throat> Start with verse 12 in the NLT. It says, Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. We've been talking a lot about revival lately and, and repentance, and that is, that is key to seeing a move of God. But that's, that's, repentance is based in the fear of the Lord. And it's not being afraid of God, but it is, it is refusing to be without God. Okay? <clears throat> and obedience falls in that same category. It falls in that fear of the Lord um, category to see I believe obedience is, is going to be key over this next time frame to see this move of God come to pass. I think it's critical for us, for, for the church as a whole, for this nation. I think it's critical. <clears throat> but I love, I love how he continues in verse 13. Paul writes, For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. See, God just doesn't call us to obedience and then not give us the tools to do it. He tells us to obey God with deep, deep reverence and holy fear. And then he says, and God is working in you, giving you the desire and the, and the power to do it. It's like when he writes about giving seed to the sower. God just doesn't tell us to sow. He didn't establish seed time and harvest without giving us the tools. He tells us, hey, there's this seed time and harvest, and here's the seed. Now sow it, and then harvest, and then you'll have more seed for more sowing and more harvesting and more seed and more. I mean, it's just continual. And the same is true with obedience. If we will trust God, he will give us the power and the ability to be obedient, to be joyful about it, to be in that mindset where we shift to, we get to be obedient because we see the opportunities that it produces in our life. 
Amen? Hallelujah. I'm telling you, this word is powerful. This word is powerful. Let's turn over to John chapter 8, verse 51 in the Amplified. And Jesus says, I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, if anyone observes my teaching, lives in accordance with my message, keeps my word, he will by no means ever see and experience death. Now death here is defined as um, eternal separation from God. It's not talking about a physical death. But he says, anyone who observes my teaching which is defined as lives in accordance with my message and keeps my word, he will by no means ever see or experience death. <clears throat> the NLT right there says, anyone who obeys my teaching will never die. Now in context, Jesus is talking about being a child of God. And that teaching, of course, if you're a child of God, you're not going to experience the eternal separation from God, right? But later to, to follow that up, um, I mean, when he's asked what the most important commandments are, Jesus sums it up into two. He takes the entire law, all of the commandments, and he sums it up into two things, right? Love God and love people, right? That is his teaching. That is his requirements. And that's, that's salvation. I mean, if, if we don't love God, we're, we're not born again. <clears throat> Love God, love people. And that's what qualifies you for salvation. Hallelujah. <clears throat> so in the last year and a half, we've talked a lot about being all in, uh, being fully committed to the Lord and to his plans and processes and what he's doing. Uh, and I know many of you, I mean, I, I recognize your faces. I can see I can hear Chip Brim bringing that, that all-in message, and I can see the faces of the people that, I mean, just filled the front of this altar. And it was just, I mean, this church is all-in, and I love it. I love it. <clears throat> but part of being fully committed is being fully submitted to his authority. So we submit, we come underneath the Lord's authority. <clears throat> Whatever, and that, that means... Whatever he says is the final word. No ifs, ands, or buts. When you're fully submitted to an authority and that authority tells you something, it's done. What, what they said is the last word, right? <clears throat> Again, that's what we're trying to teach our children. <laughs> and there's no, there's no stopping a man or a woman of God who is fully submitted and obedient to the Lord. No power in hell, no power on this earth can stop a man or woman of God that is fully submitted to the Lord. Obedience is powerful. So with our remaining time tonight, I want to look at several principles of obedience found in Scripture. Um, there's, There's a lot. Once you start looking at the word obey or obedience or uh, hearken in the King James. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. Like I told you, it's over 1,100 times in the King James Version. And, uh, but there's, there's four that really stood out to me that we're going to focus on. <clears throat> the first one, obedience can determine the level of our relationship with God. And Pastor has, has talked about this the last couple of weeks, but let's go ahead and look at James chapter 4. Hebrews, James, <clears throat> verse 8. I've got the NLT. It says, come close to God, and God will come close to you. Again, we initiate that process, right? We come close, and then God comes close. 
If we step back a couple of verses to verse 5, I like the way the Passion Translation reads it. It says, Does the Scripture mean nothing to you that says, The Spirit that God breathed into our hearts is a jealous lover who intensely desires to have more and more of us? I submit to you that God is more passionate about intimacy with us than we are with Him. But it's us that has to make that first step. It's us that determines the level of that relationship. Let's look at Luke chapter 8. Start in verse 19. It says, Then Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, but they couldn't get to him because of the crowd. Someone told Jesus, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside and they want to see you. And Jesus takes this opportunity to make a point. He says, my mother and my brothers are all of those who hear God's word and obey it. Jesus directly ties intimate relationship with him to obedience. The relationship of a mother, a brother, I mean close family, are those that hear my word and obey it. I was listening to a message uh, from John Bevere the other day, and he said this, and it really, uh, it, 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 I just enjoyed it. He said, you will never find the manifest presence of God where he is not held with utmost respect. Jesus is not coming back for a bride who has given half of her heart to someone else. He is coming back for a bride who is as passionate about him as he is about her. And he goes on to talk about the bride waiting um, at the altar. You think about that marriage relationship and how sad that would be if that bride wasn't excited to see the groom. And I guess, I mean, on this earth, it's really the groom that's waiting and the bride comes. But it feels like it's, it's reversed as we're waiting on the Lord, right? If the church is the bride and he is the groom... I want him to know that I'm excited to see him. I want to be as passionate about him as he is about me. You will never find the manifest presence of God where he is not held with utmost respect. And I see that. I just love this church. I see that happening in Victory Center. I see us valuing and, and respecting the Lord and the fear of the Lord just growing and growing and growing in our congregation. And we see more manifest presence. I mean, it's coming and it's coming in waves and it's coming and it's coming and it's growing and it's growing. And I, I, I'm with Pastor, I, I believe it's just going to keep going. It's just going to keep building and building and building and building. And it's because we're reverencing him. It's because we're respecting him and honoring him and prioritizing him. I mean, that's what we're doing these three weeks is, as that noon prayer happens. It's making him a priority, making time with him a priority, making intimacy with him a priority. And he, ah, he honors that. His manifest presence honors that. <clears throat> Just like in a marriage relationship, our faithfulness matters. It's important. All right, that was number one. Obedience can determine the level of our relationship with God. Number two, obedience is better than sacrifice. Every time I think of the word obedience, I think of the story of Saul in the Bible. So I want to take, take us over there really quick. First Samuel chapter 15. <clears throat> we'll start reading in verse 10, but a little bit of backstory. <clears throat> Samuel came to Saul. Samuel was the prophet at the time. Samuel came to Saul and gave him a word from the Lord, saying, I want you to completely destroy the Amalekites. 
He said, their sin has reached a point where I can't hold it back any longer. I need you to completely destroy the Amalekites. Completely. Cattle, men, women, I mean everything. Completely destroy. <clears throat> so Saul put the troops together, goes out, sets up, and gets ready. <clears throat> um, actually, Larry, can we start at verse 7? I know I told you 10. And we'll read a little bit here. It says, Then Saul slaughtered the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, east of Egypt. He captured Agag, the Amalekite king. Not supposed to do that. But completely destroyed everyone else. Saul and his men spared Agag's life. Not supposed to do that. And kept the best of the sheep and goats and cattle and fat calves and lambs. Everything, in fact, that appealed to them. Getting dicey for these guys. They destroyed only what was worthless and of poor quality. We can already see where their heart is in this. Verse 10, Then the Lord said to Samuel, I am sorry that I ever made Saul king. Take a step back for a second. Their heart wasn't in the right place because his heart wasn't in the right place. As their leader, his influence on them changed how they responded to the word of the Lord. Ah, that's for somebody tonight. Your influence matters. It will change, you young people, it will change your influence on the people around you. It will change how the people around you respond to the voice of the Lord. Whew. Hallelujah. Verse 11, I am sorry that I ever made Saul king, for he has not been loyal to me and has refused to obey my command. Samuel was so deeply moved when he heard this, that he cried out to the Lord all night. Early the next morning, Samuel went to find Saul. Someone told him Saul went to the town of Carmel to set up a monument to himself. Then he went on to Gilgal. He's feeling pretty good, I guess. When Samuel finally found him, Saul greeted him cheerfully. May the Lord bless you, he said. I have carried out the Lord's command. Then what is all this bleeding of sheep and goats and the lowing of cattle, I hear? Samuel demanded. It's true that the army spared the best of the sheep, goats, and cattle, Saul admitted, but they're going to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. Who's God? He didn't say the Lord my God. He said the Lord your God. <clears throat> we have destroyed everything else. And Samuel said to Saul, Stop. Listen to what the Lord told me last night. And I can see Saul like, What did he tell you? <laughs> And Samuel told him, Although you may think little of yourself, are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord has anointed you king of Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission <clears throat> and told you, Go and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, until they are all dead. Why haven't you obeyed the Lord? Why did you rush for the plunder and do what was evil in the Lord's sight? But I did obey, <clears throat> Saul insisted. I carried out the mission he gave me. I brought back King Agag, but I destroyed everyone else. Then my troops brought back the best of the sheep, goats, cattle, and plunder to sacrifice to the Lord your God and Gilgal. But Samuel replied, What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than the offering of the fat of rams. Rebellion, which is the opposite of obedience, is as sinful as witchcraft. And stubbornness is as bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Man, that's hard. <clears throat> Saul chose ritual and ceremony over obedience to the voice of the Lord. He was rejected as king because he chose his will over God's will. And this is exactly what Adam and Eve did in the garden. What they wanted over what God wanted. <clears throat> and it caused them to be rejected or ejected from the garden. 
right? Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 21. Let's start in verse 28. <clears throat> so Jesus is telling a parable here uh, to the leading priests and elders that were asking him some questions. He says, but what did he think about this? A man with two sons told the older boy, son, go out and work in the vineyard today. The son answered, no, I won't go. But later he changed his mind and went anyway. Then the father told the other son, you go. And he said, yes, sir, I will but he didn't go. Which of the two obeyed his father? They replied, the first. Then Jesus, Jesus explained his meaning. I tell you the truth, corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you do. But John the Baptist came and showed you the right way to live. But you didn't believe him, while tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even when you saw this happening, you refused to believe him and repent of your sins. <clears throat> Obedience is not just lip service. It is directly tied to our actions. I mean, the first son said, even said with his mouth, I won't go. But he did go, and he's called obedient for it. We know from James chapter 2, verse 17, faith without action is dead and useless, right? <clears throat> so the word obedience without action is dead and useless. Let's go back to James chapter 1. I know I've got a lot of scriptures tonight. Um, but once you, I mean, once you see a principle in the scripture, it's there, and you can find it everywhere. And that's how you know it's a principle, because it's not just in one place. You can see it throughout the scripture. <clears throat> chapter 1, let's read verse 19. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. And then I want to jump down to verse 22. It says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself walk away and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. The perfect law that sets you free. What did Jesus sum up the law and the commandments to? Love God, love people. And if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Hallelujah. Be quick to listen, but don't just listen. Actually do what it says. <clears throat> Obedience is better than sacrifice. It's better than ritual or ceremony. Hallelujah. Third principle I want to open up. Just a few minutes left here. Obedience unlocks God's blessings and favor in your life. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Obedience unlocks God's blessings and favor in your life. Because of grace, <clears throat> we get to choose where we will spend eternity. But our obedience on this earth will determine how we spend eternity. Okay? <clears throat> Let's look at Revelation 22, verse 12. Jesus says, look, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. <clears throat> All people according to their deeds, not just believers. His reward for us might look different than his reward, his reward for other people. I mean, we've got a lot of work to do on this earth before he comes back. 
but he's bringing a reward. I want to jump over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. to help define this a little further. Start in verse 13 in the NLT. It says, But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. We are the builders. <clears throat> the fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder re will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. So salvation is a gift. Where you spend eternity is a gift. You just get to make that choice and receive that gift. But how you spend eternity will depend on your obedience, your works, the, the things that you built while on this earth. <clears throat> Obedience unlocks the blessings, God's blessings in favor in your life. Uh, Deuteronomy 28. I can't think of God's blessings without thinking of Deuteronomy 28. Sorry about that. In verse 1, <clears throat> If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully keep all his commands that I am giving you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the world. You will experience all these blessings if you obey the Lord your God. Now again, go back to that, that legalistic religious spirit. Shake that off, right? We don't have to obey. Uh, let me rephrase that. Jesus fulfilled this law on our behalf and made these blessings in Deuteronomy 28 available to us. <clears throat> but the blessings here, they are obviously contingent upon obedience. So to qualify for that, we have to obey Jesus' teaching, Jesus' command. Love God, love people. That qualifies you for everything in Deuteronomy 28. You guys, I mean, might, you might make a note and read that <coughs> um, tomorrow or the next day just to refresh. I know you've um, read it several times, but it's, I mean, it covers every facet of your life. Absolutely every facet. And it's unlocked by loving God and loving people. I mean, Jesus did that for us. Made a way for it to be possible where it wasn't possible before. Hallelujah. Psalm 112. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. How joyful are those who fear the Lord and delight in obeying his commands. That's, I mean, that's, that's the qualifier. Everything else in Psalm 12 is dependent on that qualifier. Who fears the Lord and delight in obeying his commands. Remember, it's not a, I have to do this thing. It's an, I get to do this thing. Delight in obeying his commands. <clears throat> Their children will be successful everywhere that they go. An entire generation of godly people will be blessed. They themselves will be wealthy and their good deeds will last forever. Light shines in the darkness for, their go for the godly. They are generous, compassionate, and righteous. Good comes to those who lend money generously and conduct their business fairly. Such people will not be overcome by evil. Those who are righteous will be long remembered. They do not fear bad news. They confidently trust the Lord to care for them. They are confident and fearless and can face their foes triumphantly. They share freely and give generously to those in need. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. They will have influence and honor. I mean, we need people like that on the earth. Hallelujah. It takes people like that to advance the kingdom on the earth. And that comes as a result, a direct result, of fearing the Lord and delighting in his commands. Obedience is powerful. Powerful. Life-changing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> And not just for us, but for future generations. It says their children, it says an entire generation will be blessed. 
because of somebody's obedience. Man, that's good. All right, last one to look at tonight. Number four, obedience qualifies you for your calling. And this is probably my favorite one that stood out to me. <clears throat> so I saved it for the last. Obedience qualifies you for your calling. Hebrews chapter 5. You guys are really quiet tonight. I'm going to assume it's because you're listening so carefully. Hallelujah. Hebrews 5, start in verse 8. Even though Jesus, do I want it to NLT? Yes, I do. Okay. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. Take a step back for a second. He learned obedience from the things he suffered. <clears throat> from, from giving up his life on the cross, the physical pain that he suffered, and the things he endured on this earth for, on our behalf, he did it for us. He put God's will in front of his own. That's how he learned obedience. You want to learn obedience, you put God's will in front of yours. You want this power to be unlocked for you, you put God's will before yours. So he learned obedience from the things he suffered. Verse 9, in this way, by learning obedience, in this way, God qualified him as a perfect high priest. And he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey, who obey him. That was Jesus' purpose on this earth. That was his calling. And his obedience to the will of the Father qualified him to fulfill that calling. Your obedience qualifies you for your calling. We won't turn there. Isaiah 11, um, verse 1, it says, Jesus delights. He delighted in obedience. He loved it. It made him happy. It brought him joy. It wasn't something he felt like he had to do. It was something he got to do. Because he saw he could see down the road. He could see the potential. He could see the opportunities. He could see what it would do for us. He delighted in obedience to the Father because of the power that it would make available on this earth. Hallelujah. I'll wrap it up by saying this. <clears throat> Being faithful in your obedience will accelerate your growth. It's not just an instance, it's a lifestyle. You go back to your heroes in the Bible and you see obedience and obedience and obedience. You look at Jesus' life, you see obedience, obedience, obedience. And the more obedience, the more power, the more things become unlocked in their lives. Obedience accelerates your growth. God, I mean, it makes sense, right? God's just able to trust you with more and more and more and more because you keep proving yourself over and over and over. That's the way it worked in my house growing up. That's the way it works in my house with my kids. They prove themselves and I trust them more. They prove themselves, I trust them more. That's how it works with our Father. He loves us. He will always loves us. But how we prove ourselves to Him is through our obedience. There is true power in obedience. And it, it really... It's unlocked when we're consistent. Amen? Amen. I'll leave you with this. There's grace. God is patient. You screw up, repent, move on. Get back up and keep going. It doesn't have to slow you down unless you let it. God wants to keep moving. He wants to keep growing. He wants to keep accelerating. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, we love you. God, thank you for taking this word that used to cause us to cringe, Father, but taking it and, and making us excited over it. Lord, what opportunities are on the horizon for those that obey you, for those that are willing to put your will above their own? What potential there is, Lord. 
Hallelujah. Lord, I just ask that you would continue to develop and grow the holy fear of the Lord in this body, in this congregation, in our church. That we would continue to see the manifestation of your presence. I thank you for giving us the ability to be obedient, Lord. The power and the will to do what you're asking us to do. Lord, what a gift that is. That you are with us, you will never leave us or forsake us, and you've given us everything we need to be successful and live a godly life on this earth. Hallelujah. So Lord, I just bless these people in Jesus' name. I thank you for your holy fear falling on us and falling on this place. Come and breathe your life into us. Help us to grow in our obedience to you. Help us to honor you in everything that we say and do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you all for coming out. I hope that blessed you. I know it blessed me. And uh, have have a great rest of your week. <clears throat>